the Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press, what is the average death count attributed to each journalist? Uh, Julian Assange at the top of the show uh, uh, at a, an anti-war speech in London and of course uh, Anton Karras, uh, our theme music from The Third Man. I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical live on the fly here on 99.5 FM in New York City, a special edition of Assange Countdown to Freedom. And I, I got to tell you something, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about my guest today, because I had an opportunity to sit next to him. I was kind of nervous, but I had such a great time. This is last week on the 10th, like only my second public appearance in the last, since the pandemic started. Uh, the last one was, uh, I think, January 6th in front of the um, British Embassy on 47th Street. And it's all about Assange, both events. But I got to sit next to Roger Waters. And he was, I got to tell you something, what a, that was that was so great because you have such a great sense of humor. You made me feel so comfortable, and I thank you for that. Uh, and I, I want to say I got this email from um, from uh, John Pilger this morning uh, because he knew you were on, and this is what John Pilger had to say about Roger. Roger Waters is unique among great popular artists. He believes. His music cannot be isolated from the epic struggle for truth and justice of right against wrong. He not only stands up for Julian Assange, he does it with wisdom and grace and courage. There is no one like Roger. I salute him. That's your buddy, right? Pilger, yeah, I love Pilger. I've been working with Pilger for a long, long time. In fact, I started um, plagiarizing his material and using shit that he'd made with David Munro, a great filmmaker, uh, when I was doing my Radio Chaos tour, which was in 1987. They made a movie together, John and David, uh, called The Four Horsemen, i.e. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And it was about, as Pilger says, during the narration of that documentary, we are fueling wars. And I, I'll never forget his voice saying that thing. So, he, so he, he, back in 1987, they were making documentaries to explain to the world that the reason that we live in a state of perpetual warfare is so that the people who make the bullets and the bombs and the planes and all the other paraphernalia that goes with slaughtering people so they can all make a lot of money. It's not about anything else. And he's right. That's it's it. Uh, in, in, in back uh, where you grew up in, uh, in Great Britain, you have B, B A E that makes a fortune. Here we got Raytheon. Uh, okay, yeah. Dynamics and all these other kind of Boeing, they were all making a, a, a ton of money uh, off of war. Yeah, they, so, <laughs> and, you know, you said something in an interview with uh, John back in January. You were on uh, Consortium News and yeah. you were talking about, you know, 
I give up. I don't give up, but I'm tired of talking truth to power. It doesn't seem to be working. It's like we're, 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 we're Sisyphus climbing up and we just can't seem to get them to move. And, and you said it's better to preach to the choir. Is that how you feel? And I, I, I'm, I'm in the same boat at this point because I've been doing this for five years. Um, yeah, that, funnily enough, that's exactly how I feel. And, and that's sort of what I try and do. Um, my brain is now going, and it is going from one subject to another subject to another subject. But one thing that you just rang a bell with is um, where do my responsibilities lie? I only have one responsibility, really, as a human being, and that is to be true to the realisation that I have a capacity for empathy and that that is the most important thing in my life, bar nothing else. That is the most important thing, which is why before we start this conversation, and I'm going to preempt you now, I said, Raoul Peck, Raoul Peck. Yes, I want to talk. Okay, so we can get, we and we, actually, why don't we just go straight there? Let's go right to Raoul, yes. Raoul Peck, okay. It's a new series on HBO. Uh, okay, now Raoul Peck is famous for having made a, the great documentary about James Baldwin, called, which was I Am Not Your Negro. If you haven't seen it, watch it. But bringing you up to Raoul Peck now, he's just finished. It's a four one-hour um, episode documentary piece it's just, it's out now on HBO. You can see all four in a row if you want to. And it is called um, Exterminate the Brutes. And it is based, the title is based upon a book written by a great friend of Raoul Peck's, who is called Sven Lindqvist, who is, was a Swe who's a Swedish writer. Okay, and they were they became firm friends over the making of this. But basically, he is, he is telling the real story of what has happened to all of us collectively since 1492, when the Catholic Church and the powers that be in Spain decided that it was okay to declare that the most important thing in their metaphysical and physical lives was pure blood. So they, for the first time in history, the Spanish in 1492 identified the Jews and the Arabs and anybody else who they didn't consider pure Spanish blood to be outside the limits of our empathy and our laws, and in consequence, uh, should be subject to um, are getting rid of them, wipe them off the face of Spain, and if necessary, off the face of the earth. And that was the start of it, or that was the beginning of the idea that some animals are more equal than others, and that and that the superior animals in this, in the as it developed over the next few hundred years, the European animals were superior to all the other animals in the world, all the other human beings in the world, obviously, I'm, I mean, and in consequence were at liberty to enslave them, use them, murder them, massacre them, steal from them, plunder them, treat them as if they were vegetables. You know, okay. so and yeah. he's, so this documentary is an absolute must watch, and I'll say no more about it. Just tell us the name of it again. Exterminate the Brutes. All right. And uh, you can uh, see that right now, all four uh, episodes. And I'm looking forward to it. And it's on, not Netflix, it's on... HBO. HBO, okay. It's on HBO. And what, what's important is, you know, you. I, I wondered who that was who kept putting his hand on my knee at that Assange <laughs> meeting in New York. It was you. I recognize you now. Oh, you got a you got a nasty sense of humor. John Houston in Chinatown said to Jack Nicholson, "You got a nasty, nasty uh, reputation, Mister Geddes. 
uh, I like that. So I like your sense of humor. It's uh, great and sometimes dark, like Julian Assange. Uh, I, you know, I, your activism, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I've, I've been following, you, following your activism for years in the music, for decades. But uh, I, I, I think of four people. Uh, Dick Gregory, uh, the, the uh, great political satirist, uh, Harry Belafonte, both of whom uh, have been on my show, Dick Gregory Pass, Pete Seeger, and then uh, Paul Robeson, because these artists not only were great artists, but they put everything they had, never spared themselves to plunge into the good fight. So uh, that's what I, when I'm, I'm looking at you, you're a composite because where did your activism come from? I know you come from working class roots. Uh, your parents are both teachers. Uh, what drove you in this direction? Um, well, you just said it, my parents, boom, there you are, end of story. My mum, because she survived the Second World War, my father didn't, my father was killed by the Nazis at Anzio on February the 18th, 1944. I was born on, on in September 43, so I was only five months old, boom, he died. But I was left with a, the legacy of his heroism. His heroism was not to go and kill Nazis. His heroism was to be a conscientious objector and to spend the whole of the Blitz in London driving an ambulance because they said to him, I say, so what's your trouble? Well, I can't kill people. I'm very sorry, but I'm a Christian and we're not allowed to kill people. Mm, we, uh, what about, can you drive? Yes, I can drive an ambulance in London. So he did, and that's what he did. And then he joined the Communist Party and he became converted to the notion that the Third Reich had to be fought. And unfortunately, the killing of, of German soldiers was a necessary evil. But So he went back and he said, uh, excuse me, I've changed my mind. And they went, good God, this chap, A, he's changed his mind, and B, he has a degree from Durham University Officer material. So he was, he did six weeks basic training and then he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in a London regiment. In a, flew out to North Africa, then into Sicily, and then up the road to Anzio. And, and a few weeks later, boom, he was killed. So it's an extraordinarily heroic story to, first of all, to be a conscientious objector, which was not popular. It's never been popular in any war, and it's one of the bravest things that a man can do, in my view. But then to go, oh, I've changed my mind and go and get killed is almost unbearably heroic. That left my mum. I'm just going to go on for a minute. Go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you something that my mum did to me. She did two things to me. Well, she did a lot. She obviously, she brought me up and my brother sort of single-handed in Cambridge after the war. But one, the most important thing she did to me, one day, I have no idea how old I was, probably 12 or 13, I was struggling with something or other. And my mother looked at me and she said, you know, you know, through your life, Roger, you're going to be faced with all sorts of difficult questions and decisions. And, and Now, when you are faced with a... a faced with something difficult. He said, I will, this is my advice to you. I want you to try and do the research into whatever it might be, find out as much as you can about the facts of the matter, research it thoroughly, listen to other opinions by all means, listen to all opinions, blah, 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 blah. When you've done all of that, you will have done all the heavy lifting. The work is over. After that, the next bit is really easy. Oh, yeah, what's that, Mum? Do the right thing. Wow. wow. And you have uh, all your life. Uh, father. Well, we try, don't we? I, you know, my father spent uh, 10 years in prison uh, before I was born. And, uh, you know, I, I got into comedy when I was young. I was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in 84. And, you know, I was going in the right direction, but uh, somehow in the 90s, I, I, I just had to get away from it. And I got involved in, in the criminal justice 
as an activist uh, against the uh, prison industrial complex. I mean, I do it still occasionally, uh, but uh, that's what uh, really formulated my future was that seat, my father's horror stories, because he was in that prison. Uh, if you saw Shawshank Redemption, where Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman spent their time, that was the Ohio State Reformatory. And I, I heard nothing, but and it, it never left him, you know. It never, that, that whole experience, uh, we, we all felt the consequences, although he was a great provider and a great man. And, um, and because of, you know, he was a male nurse in the, um, in the TB ward, and it was 100% African-American. Because of that, this second generation Italian had very enlightened views out of Cleveland uh, on race. And so I got, I got that combination. All right, so I'm not talking about me anymore, but uh, you know, as far as your, fa your father, you, you wrote the, the final cut, uh, a 43 minute requiem. Uh, did you, were you working on that for a long time? Were you like contemplating writing something? <laughs> it's funny you should say that, but before I move on to that, which I will, because I've told you, I'll talk to you all effing day if you want, uh, but your father, formed his um, forward-thinking views on race before he had the benefit of the knowledge of the research into the genome that we didn't get till 20 years ago. It wasn't till 20 years ago that finally this nugget fell into our hands where we finally had the concrete, absolute proof that there is no such thing as race. Exactly. You know it's what? An invention invented by the fucking Spanish in whenever I said to you, 1642 or whenever it was, you know, uh, 1492, excuse right. me, in 1492. So bully for your father to have figured it out a bit earlier than the rest yeah. of us had a there's chance to. There's a great book by Ian Tattersall, who's the... Um, uh, curator emeritus at the Museum of Natural History on race. And he proves there's no such thing as race. We all come from the same, you know, original yeah. from uh, salamanders or whatever. It's, uh, it's, uh, we all have the same DNA if you go all the way back to the beginning uh, of time. Um, well, well, I wasn't actually including the salamanders, but the human race, <laughs> Homo sapiens, as distinct from the Neanderthals and Australopithecus or whatever. There were other kind of strands, but Homo sapiens was, was the form of human life that actually uh, survived from 200,000 years ago when we discovered them, either in East or North Africa, you can take your pick, but definitely in Africa. And we are all brother, cousins and brothers and sisters. We are all descended from those original human beings who came out of Africa. We did spread all over the world. And, it, and finally, now we can acknowledge this. And this is part of what Raoul, it's a tiny part of Raoul's um, documentary, but it's an important part in my view. Well, it's exactly what, what Tattersall said. Everyone e emerged out of Africa. You're absolutely right. That's uh, his conclusion or, or his research. And uh, he's a very thorough man. He's an uh, uh, anthropologist extraordinaire. Um, final cut. Final cut. Final cut. Yes, let's talk about final cut. Uh, it's, it's, it's like Mozart's requiem uh, to his father. Uh, yeah. Did that uh, inspire you? Yeah, just a bit. Um, well, who Mozart? Mozart, not so much. No, I find notes. I'm. This is the only thing I agree with anyone called Leopold about, because don't get me set off on the Belgians and the Congo and all of that, and Heart of Darkness, and Conrad, and all of that. Well, you just did, but I'm going to ignore that. Uh, yeah, Leopold. Leopold. Uh, I think it was called Leopold of of Austria was the one who, after uh, Mozart presented him with the ma with a performance of a sketched out version of the Magic Flute, he said, mm, "Quite good, but there are too many notes." And I have to say, I somewhat agree with him about that. I'm not a huge fan of that, you know, of 
of that kind of period of class. Though Mozart was clearly a genius and he was a prodigy, and I mean, he wrote most of this stuff when he was when he was still yeah. drinking milk from his mother's. You know, he was about that big when he when he. Anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. What, what were we talking about? We were talking uh, about uh, the final cut. Yeah. How yeah. about we go to a, a quick break and you'll come back? You want to get that? Yeah, we'll sure. Whatever you, you want to do. All right, we'll be right back uh, with Roger uh, Waters. We were, we would we were talking a bit earlier randy uh about john pilger and and david munro and whatever and i was reminded i've written a new song recently and it's called the bar and it's 13 minutes long and it, it bangs on about all kinds of stuff but one of the things it does is it it nods to dylan who was probably quite rightly left out of your list of sort of political heroes in that he's not really that direct and also he disavows any intention to be political whenever he talks about his songs and we love him dearly because he did write the immortal words the pump don't work because the vandals took the handle mm -hmm. but he also wrote some other stuff i'm just going to read you a few lines from the second half of this song that i've been that i've recorded made de a demo and it goes, and this is a reference to Dylan, obviously, because it goes, you are my sad eyed lady, come lay across my big bias, brass bed. Maybe it is we who have been chosen, you and me, to point out this don't make no fucking sense. How many cannonballs must fly, Bob? How long and winding is the road? How many children tugging on how many mother's sleeves saying, look, Ma, the man ain't got no fucking clothes. You can help them build a bomb at Raytheon, but they'll sell it on in Kalamazoo and some crazy motherfuckers bound to drop it on a busload of kids going to school. You can hold up your hands in denial, justify the choices in your head, just doing your job, just an innocent cog, but those little Yemeni kids will still be dead. Do I sound a tad holier than thou? Well, sir, maybe I am. I'll admit it came easy to me to resist this fucking system, uneducated as I am. I eschewed the Bible for Ken Kesey, thought I'd try on a different hat. You see, just following orders don't come easy to me. I guess it just ain't where I'm at. It's just two more standards. And when I'm drinking my coffee in the morning and I read about all this Yemeni shit, I feel so fucking bad for that grieving foreign dad picking through the bus that's just been hit. So on Monday, when you're walking through the factory gates and on Friday when you're picking up your check, he'll be sitting on the curbside like the bicycle thief, but with no boy to put his arms around daddy's neck. I'll read you, I, I read you that because it, it springs into my heart when I hear the name John Pilger. Yeah, you know, I've seen almost all of his films the, from Vietnam, uh, The Quiet Mutiny, uh, all the way up to um, uh, The Coming War on China, which uh, we can talk about when we uh, uh, come back uh, from this break. And we are going to take a break. And this is something special. I spoke to Nils Melzer this morning. Yeah. He's a fan of yours. And so, uh, so we're going to go out, uh, WBAI, and with this, and we're going to come back, uh, a, a Assange Countdown to Freedom, uh, after we play this. This is Nils Melzer, who actually was trained as a uh, uh, classical pianist. And uh, this is his version. It's in double speed. Uh, his version, A Moonlight Sonata, which he says is misunderstood because it really wasn't a sonata to begin with uh, by Beethoven. It was... Uh, you know, it was a, what is it, a quasi una fantasia. 
Uh, it was a, an, an Allegro uh, version. And that's what he plays here. And we're gonna play uh, a few bars of that and we'll be right back for those uh, uh, Countdown to Freedom uh, listeners uh, with, uh, with more, with uh, Roger Waters. We'll be right back. Okay, I'm Randy Credico, Randy Credico, live on the fly on 99.5 FM here in New York City, uh, Assange's Countdown to Freedom, and uh, my special guest is uh, co-founder of Pink Floyd and superstar uh, composer and um, activist, Roger Waters, and uh, it's really, um, I got to tell you something, your, your, your um, activism for Assange but you want to talk about something else first. You want to talk, let's talk about Final Cut, then we'll talk about Assange. Okay. Well, I think you asked me why I got to Final Cut. And I was going to look and see if I could find uh, the uh, sort of rough cut of my memoir about that. So, and I can't because it's on my laptop. It's not on this computer in my studio, which I'm sitting in my recording studio. You can see because we're yeah, on Zoom. And it's it's behind me, it's guitars and a mixing console and blah and whatever. But I can talk about it because we when we came to make the final cut, which was the last record I did with Pink Floyd, the the thing that we'd done previously was the wall. Uh, and previously we'd done animals and previously wish you were here and dance with the moon. So um so we just we just come off an enormous enormous project, which was the war, uh, and made a movie and done and done a number of shows, and the show was hugely um, new, revolutionary in the way it was put together in terms of rock theatre and so on and so on and so on and so forth. So. And, and also there were all kinds of divisions and splits going on in the band. It was a problem. Rick had gone. We'd got rid of Rick because for all sorts of reasons that I don't need to go into now, really. But so there were the three of us. And so, you know, what to do? What to do next? Um, not easy to follow something like The Wall. But the wall had been a sort of a bit of a one man tour de force, as had animals and as had almost everything for the last kind of 10 years under my under my direction. So we came to the final cut. Um, you know, so there were three of us left. There was there was the drummer. Forget his name now. No, I don't forget his name. <laughs> I adore Nick, I have to say. He's he's still a close friend, you know. Notwithstanding all the history and everything and blah, blah, blah. There are some people in life who you love and they, and they become deeply settled in your heart. And he was the guy in Pink Floyd, apart from Sid, who was my oldest. He wasn't my oldest friend, but he was the person I was closest with. The others, not so much. Anyway, where am I going with this final cut? Hey, Nick, what do you think we should do? Make a new record. Nick's response would be, vroom, vroom, because really all he was interested in is racing cars, you know, and, and buying them and selling them and all that stuff. So, Dave, well, I sort of need two or three years to write a song. Um, yeah, but, um, okay. 
Roger, what's your idea? Oh, my God. I've got all this stuff going round in my head about the promised land, about Jerusalem, about William Blake and about Rupert Brooke and about the First World War and about the Second World War and about the Attlee government and about the welfare state and about the possibility that human beings can come together to cooperate with one another in a way that is... Um, that sets aside Victorian neoliberal economics and blah, 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 in some way that cocks the snoot at the idea of the divine right of kings and moves forward into a new era of this and that and the other. Also, I feel a deep sense of the betrayal of the men like my father who lost their lives in the Second War, Second World War in order to fight against the Third Reich and the perils that faced us all if the Nazis won the war and blah, 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 blah. And also on blah, blah, blah. Stop me if you get bored, Nick. Oi, Dave, pay attention. I'm talking about something important here, blah, blah. And I could I could talk for an hour about what I wanted to write the next record about because I feel deeply and passionately about things. And, and, and so eventually... I went, look, if you don't care about this or any of the things that I'm talking about, I'll make it as a solo record. No, no, no. No, don't do that. Because as we all know in rock and roll bands, material ideas is key to everything. Without that, you might just as well get out your brazen bit, drill a hole in the fucking bottom of the boat and sink without trace because that's what's going to happen because you have to have somebody who gives a fuck. Otherwise, you have nothing to say. So that's the short story of why the final cut is what, and it's a great record, by the way. It's been denigrated by some people and hugely kind of lauded by others. And it is what it is, but it's, passionate and it's extremely musical and luckily i found a wonderful team of people to work with on it um particularly michael Kamen, who had done all the orchestrations on the wall and i who i had worked with on the solo album or did work with afterwards on my solo and pros and cons so I, there's nothing much more to say about the final cut except that a lot of people hold it dear because it gives a fuck. Right. And if they hold it dear for that reason, I'm content. I can go to sleep every night knowing that I've done my job. Yeah, it certainly is uh, a, an epic piece of work. And, you know, you can you can listen to it or you can actually uh, read the lyrics uh, because uh, they are there. And I'm glad you mentioned William Blake because I'm a big fan of uh, William Blake, who called Voltaire and Rousseau merchants of uh, of uh, philosophy, by the way. Uh, we're talking with uh, with Roger Waters. I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical, live on the fly, uh, 99.5 FM in New York City. But uh, this is a Countdown to Freedom, Assange Countdown to Freedom a special. Uh, and and we were at that event the other day. I was only there, by the way, and I got to mention his name because I had to see him again yesterday so I could do this today and then drive up to Woodstock. And that is Dr. Klaus, who's he got his first he got his first uh, good, uh, electric guitar uh, because of, uh, uh, I think, time. You know, he heard that. He, he went out and got it. And then he got into dentistry. But uh, he saved me twice, both times for you. Both times. He, got, he squeezed me in last uh, Thursday. And then <laughs> just before I left, he says, come on down. All right. So thank you. Just, just in case your listeners don't know what the fuck you're talking about. This is because Randy's teeth fall out at regular intervals, <laughs> like one every 20 minutes approximately. Right. No, and he you. has this magic dentist, Dr. Klaus, yeah. who somehow manages to keep him going. From So yeah. the smile is there, is always there. It's a facade. It's a Pemkin village. All right. No, it's one, one tooth that keeps, it, he's working on it and it keeps popping out because it's uh, ersatz, um, uh, what do you call it, a cap. Uh, I'm waiting for the, the real thing to show up in a couple of weeks. Now, 
So we were able, I was able to go to this event, sit next to you at the Assange. What got you involved in, in the Assange movement? Well, obviously I'd followed, I, I had been following WikiLeaks with joy in my heart ever since it started to appear. Um, and then in, what is it, 10 years ago now, 11 years ago now, um, no, 13 years ago in 2007, Bradley as she was then, now Chelsea Manning, um, leaked all the information that she did uh, from Iraq to Julian Assange at WikiLeaks, and he published all those papers, thousands and thousands of pages of information about what was actually going on in the illegal invasion of Iraq. But they included the collateral murder video, which for all of us, the first time that you see that thing, you burst into tears, or if you don't, actually burst into tears you can't breathe because you're so disgusted with who we've become that we have become what Raoul Peck is talking about in his documentary and that and Iraq and Baghdad and the collateral murder was an extension of exterminate all the brutes as far as these young American airmen were concerned, the people on the ground were the inhuman brutes, the enemy, the ones who've been designated as dispensable. So you can mow them down with 30 millimeter machine gun fire with emotional and psychological impunity except you can't because it's not built into your dna to do that you've been taught to do it by the fucking r by the i nearly said raf that would have been true if it was dresden you know right, right. and we've all read slaughterhouse five i hope so we all understand what it was like to be there because of Kurt Vonnegut. Never mind all the pictures that we saw, but that was not a war crime after the Second World War. Buchenwald and Auschwitz and all the other things were, but the but Nagasaki and Hiroshima were not war crimes, and neither was the firebombing of Hamburg and Berlin and Dresden and all the other German cities, where we went in specifically to murder the civilian population to bring them to heal. Well, and, you know, there are anyway, many, we can sorry. talk about that. Uh, what uh, the, the Turkey uh, did to, to uh, the Armenians, you know, the uh, World War II, not just uh, what they did to Jews, but uh, to Slavs. I mean, everyone was subhuman, and these soldiers were able to do it. Right now, we see it in Israel, which, of course, is a third rail. If I ever talk about Israel, I get in trouble, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, but uh, and of course, we did it with Native Americans and we sl enslaved African Americans. So I guess it goes back to 1492. Uh, I'm going, by the way, I'm going to Istanbul on Thursday. Oh, you are? Not Istanbul. physically. I'm going by Zoom. Oh, I'm being, okay. I'm being given an award and I'm very grateful for it by um, some organization in Istanbul. It's an Islamic organization or whatever. And they, they're giving me an award because of my support for the Palestinian people. They're also, I'm happy to say, in the same program, giving Ilan Pape an award. He gets an award for academic excellence in the whatever and the support of Abdullah. I get my award for being cultural or artistic or, or something. or other. But I'm faced with a dilemma when I go to turkey do i say anything to erdogan or do i keep my fucking mouth shut now are you doing this by zoom i guess uh, i don't know if you want to infuriate the guy uh i, I don't, don't want to infuriate him yes uh well i saw that you got this award and uh, congratulations because 
uh, you have been a, a stellar supporter of, of, of Palestinians uh, for, for years. I, I don't think I know anyone in your position that even comes close. Uh, Max Blumenthal, as a writer, is, is, is there, you and Max. And Max has been on this show many times. Uh, and uh, he uh, is called a self-loathing Jew uh, because he, you know, I'm Italian-American, all right? You know, if someone wants to knock Mussolini, they can knock Mussolini. Want to talk about uh, Italy uh, going all the way back, uh, even now their uh, alliance with NATO. You know, you can attack them. I don't consider that anti-Italian. Uh, but if you attack the Israeli government, that's equated with being an anti-Semite. It's, it's ridiculous. Yes, it is. Yeah. All right, we're talking with Roger. So uh, getting back to Assange, yeah, I guess yeah. you might that uh, trial, uh, whatever that that farce that uh, uh, you know that uh, that show trial. Uh, what what was going through your head when, when you saw what he was going through during uh, those two uh, phases last year? Well, I'm sorry to keep bringing Raoul back into it, but we live in a world where we are expected by the mainstream media and by the powers that be, the governments that make the decisions supposedly on our behalf, we are supposed to look at the world through a lens that they define. This is why I hate Zuckerberg so much, is because he's in cahoots with them. You know, the, fa the Facebook people, they have meetings with the CIA. They sit and decide what they're going to do. CIA having figured out, and the Pentagon having figured out that this is a very important part of the engine. How do you persuade billions of people all over the world that what you're doing is fine and you shouldn't worry about it? You get fucking Mark Zuckerberg to tell them that it is, and he's completely content to do it. You know, yeah, but so anyway, let's let we don't need to go there. Julian Assange. Well, Quite clearly, Julian Assange is one of the most valuable individuals in any of in our lifetime. He figured out something that the internet can do that is virtuous and deeply necessary to the whole of the human race and to everyone in society. And that is to publish the truth about what goes on in the world so that we, an informed then public, can, can make up our own minds as to whether we want to be murdering civilians in Baghdad out of helicopter gunships or not. Okay. And so he just lays it out. There it is in front. You can decide whether you think those were innocent civilians, the two Said and El Nier, the two uh, Reuters cameramen who were murdered, along with 10 other civilians, some of whom were people who stopped to try and help the wounded in a van with children in it. And they opened fire on that as well. So, but we all know that story. But so Julian, and it's not just that he's opening up things, showing how iniquitous the behavior is of our so-called leaders. Incredibly important work. He should be being given medals in public square. We should be make, building statues to the man, the great publisher, the bringer of truth to all of our lives possibly a man who can help to save the world from these fucking assholes. All right. No, no they go, Ooh, you can't tell them that. We don't want them to know that. So they want to kill him. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to kill him. And if they get him into a prison in America, you know this better than anyone with all the work that you've done on the penal system in America, they will kill him. Absolutely. He yeah. will die. There's no safety. There's no oversight here. And I don't even know what the powers that be in, in, in the UK, what they're thinking right now. Because I do. They're thinking, um, uh, Boris Johnson, he's saying, I don't, well, well, you know, we just have to do whatever Washington wants, you know, because we have to remember which side our bread is buttered. And you know, that's it's all about. I mean, the that's UK, all it's basically, about. Basically, as John Pilger said, is a vassal state. The UK yeah. uh, 
Wes. Do you think it's slipped, descended to that level? What the UK? Well, it, it's always been it's always been a slave to its own policies, which, which are murderous. The, I mean, the the, um, the the colonial record of what's now called the United Kingdom, but used to be called England or Great Britain, is second to none in the horrific number of atrocities that we the people, or in the name of we the people, the East India Company right. and the rest, they're no different than American fruit or whatever your company was called. They go all around the world killing everybody to steal their shit. Right. That is who we are. Yes, and it it's goes about way back. It goes and way it, back to EIC. It yeah. It goes so way now, back. So now we have to go, wow, is that who we want to be? Well, we can't do anything about that when it happened, except say, fuck, that was so terrible. How did we allow the ruling class to do that, not just to them, but to us as well? To us, they did it to us too. I mean, they did it to the working class because they forced the kids up the chimneys and they made everybody work in factories for unbearably long hours. And, and they slowly, slowly, slowly that became somewhat humanized over hundreds of years that it took to gain any kind of rights for working people. And so, but now they have to be persuaded to go mea culpa. We were wrong and they won't. They will. No, they won't do that. They won't do that. The U.S. is slow in apologizing uh, to the victims. Of, well, what about your, the Native American? I, I'm not. I don't want to get into that conversation. Right, right. I, listen, I, you know, you read, read Eduardo Galeano about the history of the Americas and uh, memories of fire, and uh, just it's it's a wonderfully uh, written trilogy, and you'll see. And it's very simple to read all the way from. You know, a thousand years ago, Genesis goes all the way up until uh, I think 1988 in Nicaragua. Um, I so can hear the trolls. Sorry to interrupt, right? I can hear this. Why don't you go and live in China, you right. fucking pinko asshole? I get it all. And, uh, you know, my, my answer to that would be hey, troll, just calm down a little bit. Why don't you wake up and find some joy in your life before you die? Because you're going to die within a heartbeat. Life is very short. And to live with the hatred that you live with and the feeling of supremacy and, and that you live with exterminate the brutes as your ongoing reason to be alive and your ethos makes me pity you beyond almost my disgust for you. These are you know? emotional uh, individuals that uh, have uh, poisoned souls. Uh, you know, I mean, poor Julian. I mean, there's not that much support in the US. Believe me, I've been doing this Assange countdown for five years uh, now, and uh, there really isn't that much support. And I, and I really ascribe it to the media because the media has been missing in action. If you want to call it media, it, it's, it makes the BBC look like uh, honest truth tellers, what we have in the US. So, Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, Making the BBC look like honest truth tellers. You've seen all the bullshit that they're putting out on programs like Panorama and this absurd, uh, there's been a program on Radio 4 in England put out by somebody called Chloe Hajimatu. What an arsehole this woman is. She puts together one of those, it's called a docudrama, and you just lie and lie and lie. It, hers is all about Syria, so which is a completely, you know, it's a whole, whole different subject. But the thing that you were saying about the mainstream media or the media not supporting Julian just shows how sick society is and how cowed we all are that we imagine being a journalist and not that not being your foremost thing that every morning you wake up and go first let's free Assange because 
we are all under the knife here. If we let Assange go down, we all go down because we have given them permission to murder a great publisher and a great human being and a great journalist because they're ashamed of what they've done and that we're allowing that to happen. But they are, you're right. They, so, they really, are, they really as, as John Pilger has said time and again, is that uh, Assange has shamed uh, most journalists uh, because what he has done is uh, not do what they've done, which is uh, to uh, put out the big lie, as Goebbels called it. Yeah. Uh, so, I, it, you know, it, you watch these shows, these shows on, uh, on MSNBC or CNN, and it's, it's all these panel discussions. It, it, and it, 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 there's like no real debate. There was a show called the McLaughlin Group. I don't know if you remember that uh, back in the- uh, I do remember, yeah. They had five points of view. The right, the far right, the extreme right, the fascist right, and the third right. That's what they were all about. And so that's what you have. They're patterned after that. And, and the parameters are so narrow. They yeah. don't get into it. Uh, we don't know what's going on in China. We get one view from the White House and Barbara Starr from CNN, uh, who may as well be Operation uh, Mockingbird is still at work here. Uh, but uh, for not... They, I, I was on those shows, but they wanted to talk about Russiagate and this bogus narrative about Assange getting uh, material and giving it to Roger Stone. It was a complete, you know, hoax. But they ran with that. And that was the only time they put me on uh, to the talk manifold, about The manifold visits. Were... But they won't put me on to talk about Julian Assange. No. Uh, and I've tried repeatedly. He, the, his father and brother are in this country. Uh, what do you make of that tour? And, and what do you think the results will be? Well, I think it's heartwarming. And I hope it has results. And will it? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, my friend, because we live in such an insane environment that you think every day you wake up and Joe Biden and that moron Blinken don't go, hey, We've okay. We've looked at it now, Assange. We're not going to. We're going to drop all the charges against you. We don't want to extradite you. We'll leave you. The Brits can do what they want with you, and they they will then go. Whew, let him go back to Australia. Let him, we don't give a shit anymore. Whatever. But they. But why won't they do it? What is yeah. wrong with it? They, they're insane. You have to say Biden and Blinken are insane to do what they're doing. It's completely... So, will John and, Ge and Gabriel uh, Shipton succeed with their Whistletop tour in changing anything enough? Did we have an effect when we had our, uh, our panel in New York last Thursday? I don't know. You certainly you know on Facebook. The, uh, your comment uh, on, uh, about Facebook, which was really brought the house down uh, has uh, certainly conferred a lot of uh, publicity uh, in your direction. And Assange warned us about Facebook years ago. He said, delete Facebook. And uh, my friend Margaret Ratner Kunstler did back then. I'm still on it to promote stuff, but I, I really Me too, brother. Me too. And I feel bad about it. But, you know, I, I really do. I don't, obviously, I haven't felt bad enough it to go, I'm not dealing with you anymore. Because that's a bit like saying, okay, I'm going to become a hermit. Because you have to accept that they have enormous, they have enormous, they have the ears of um, everybody in the world who's got a fucking iPhone, they've got their ear. Right. So if you refuse to communicate, you could be accused of being a Luddite or you could just be accused of being a fucking idiot because nobody's going to hear you. And that's weird that that's what people took out of what we did last Thursday is they, that they didn't latch on to, oh, yeah, this is insane that they've got this guy locked up. They latched on to Roger Waters used the F word when talking about fucking Zuckerberg. That's what they've learned. And he won't let him use his song. Somehow that is the 
thing that they care about. It's well, maybe because it transcends political boundaries. So people who care about freedom might be happy because the censorship thing, but also people who love Donald Trump go are probably going, yeah, Zuckerberg, or yeah, Doran, or whatever the guy, not Doran, he runs Madison Square Garden, whatever his name Dorsey. is. Dorsey. Dorsey, yeah. yeah. That bastard shut our great hero Donald Trump up. You know, what about the First Amendment of freedom of speech and blah, and blah, blah, and uh, whatever. So it, it's... But, I, you know, who knows? Who knows where any of that will end? Will the Assange boys create enough of it? I really hope so. Will those of us who are trying to support Steve Danziger yes. and in the Ecuadorian indigenous people's fight against Chevron Corporation? I fucking hope so. I hope so. But I live with hope. And I, I don't believe it's impossible. I do believe that the Chevron thing eventually will crumble. Well, well let me ask you this. Why, why are so few uh, uh, artists like yourself? And I, I remember uh, Billy Bragg came out and was slammed Assange. And then the ones that we see all the time uh, at various events, uh, you don't see them out strongly for Assange. I mean, I, I saw uh, Susan Sarandon show up at, at the Donziger uh, trial, uh, the two of you. Uh, has she uh, said anything about Assange? Have you spoken to her about it? I haven't talked to her about it, but I only met her for the first time at the Donziger protests outside the courthouse, and I adored her on site. Well, I sort of adored her anyway, because she's been outspoken on many political issues and obviously has a heart and cares about things. But I haven't had a chance to speak to her about Assange, but I certainly will. But, you know, I have had a chance to speak to lots of people about Assange, and I have trouble containing my rage because... The smear campaign against Assange was so successful. Um, you know, that when you talk to people, you can see women wrinkling their noses and, oh, but he's that rapist. And you right. go, whoa, 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 let me stop you there. He never, he never, he never raped anyone. He never he physically, he had no sexual problems with anyone. Never charged. Ever. He was never charged. He was with never charged with anything. Nobody accused him of anything. It's an invention of the governments fed to the fed to a docile media like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post here, and all the same papers all over the world to paint a picture of Julian Assange because they want him dead. And you, Mrs. Wrinkling Your Fucking Nose, have bought it, but none of it's true. It's completely untrue. And what I thought was fascinating was that Niels Meltzer, in the interviews that he did, said that even he, and he admitted this, when he was asked as the special rapporteur on torture for the United Nations to look into the Assange case, when he was asked, he felt an instinctive, I'm not sure I want to do that. Isn't he that bloke who wipes the wall with cat shit or, and rapes women? He, he, and he suddenly caught himself and realised, hang on a minute, I don't know that. I don't know if I've read that. Yeah, Melzer's been great. Melzer's got a new He's book. He's been now. fantastic, but he looked into it. And right. almost the most important thing he said was, I was completely wrong to have been sucked into that false narrative. But how powerful it is and how difficult it is for those of us who want a free press, believe that we should be told the truth by journalists, believe that the fourth estate is extremely important to the working of any functioning democracy, are in a minority. Right. How is that possible? Well, Melzer speaks uh, perfect uh, uh, Swedish, and he did an investigation. It's in his uh, new book, uh, The Case of uh, Julian Assange, which is out in German and will be out in English. We spoke to him just a, a few months back when the right. book came out, and I, I hope people will read that. Uh, he certainly was um, buffaloed in, in the beginning, and he was you know, reluctant to get in, and so many others. And you talk about the Swedish uh, bogus allegations, 
uh, never any charges. And then, of course, the connection to Trump. Everyone thinks all these liberals now, you know, connected to Trump and it's complete garbage. He puts out material, he gets material and he puts it out. You know, why hasn't Bernie Sanders come out in support of him? He exposed the fact that Bernie was robbed of the nomination in 2016. You would think he'd be one of his biggest champions. Why did Bernie Sanders come out and support Guaido in Venezuela? Did he do I mean, that? Yeah, he fucking did. Right there and then on day one. When that happened, I went, I mean, I, I went, Bernie, Bernie, don't, what the fuck is wrong with you? You disgusting piece of shit. Why are you doing this? You're right. buying that narrative? Yeah. This is the Bolivarian Revolution. I thought you were supposed to be a, a, a supporter of the working class. This, right. And it is something that, in fact, you later discovered when you heard other interviews and things that he knew nothing about, zero. This is one of the problems, right, with American politics is that you're so parochial, right. in, all your politicians are, that they never look beyond the parish fence. They never, they know nothing. They're ill-educated. Well, it's true. It's definitely true. And, 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 and Sanders' foreign policy, he is um, a, a little lacking in, in knowledge of foreign policy, but he's always been like that. Other politicians, and, and, and I, I really hate to say it, but I talked to Cornell West about this. Why are so many black media figures uh, and uh, black politicians who are progressive domestically, but uh, are not that good on foreign policy. It's not a priority of theirs. They, they, they fall for this China and Russia saber rattling, uh, the excuses that uh, Biden comes up with and Blinken. Uh, oh, can I tell you why? Yes. Because they get to join the supremacist club. They get to be part of the supreme team. They get to be part of the shining city on the hill when they believe that total bullshit that that's what America is. They get to be friends with Ronald Reagan, the fucking mass murderer of El Salvador. They get to be all of that. They get to be part of this package that America is exceptional. Yeah, it is. It's exceptionally awful. Yes. He you mentioned Ronald Reagan. You know, I did him on The Tonight Show back in 1984. And uh, the Sandinistas have done it again. They've invaded Honduras. And I have a photograph that bears me out. Well, it's not exactly a photograph. It's a shadow graph. As you can see, the guy with the duck head is Daniel Ortega. There he is. And there he goes. And God bless America, the greatest nation in the land. Yeah, so Reagan was a staple for me. Actually, uh, I had a great- well, That's very good. Bravo. Yeah. I enjoyed Thank that. Thank you very much. It just yeah. gave me an opening. I, I figured I'd just toss that in there. I won't get into the other presidents that I used to do. Uh, but uh, who's pulling the strings, ultimately? You are. No, I'm on- It's on, your on, show, on, brother. On the Assange, the Assange oh. persecution. Who is really calling the shots? Is it the CIA, the NSA? We know it's not the politicians. Their, their strings are being pulled. Uh, guys like Boris Johnson, you had a great, uh, very humorous thing about Pojo the other day. Who's well, pulling? They, they all are. The powers that be, call them what you want, the ruling class, I don't give a shit what the nouns are. And I don't, and you can't, you could, we could name a hundred names who are all part of it, but we're not going to, but we could if we wanted to, or if we sat down and could be bothered to. And, and so, and what, but what is their agenda? They want to keep the very wealthy, very wealthy, and they want to keep the slaves, slaves. That means everybody in the pr prison population that you're talking about. It means the whole of the working class. Everybody who owes money to a credit card company and is enslaved by debt, they want to keep them all exactly where they are so that they can keep them working. So in order to do that, they have to, A, they have to identify China or Russia, take your pick, or Iran, 
or somebody else if it becomes necessary because you have to have a common enemy or immigrants or muslims or mexicans or guatemalans or whoever it doesn't matter but so they need to do that and they need a docile press to do that for them all of those things and they but why do they need to do this so that they can go on living in the lap of luxury and feeling manly because they've got little dicks the whole lot of them they suffer from little dick complex and it's the only way they can feel big and powerful is by slaughtering other people and by pretending that there is a conflict that only they can save the poor ordinary people from and unfortunately their propaganda system is so intense and so efficient that the poor ordinary people buy it yeah well i want the, the uh one of his um uh, dumps was uh vault 7 uh assange and so i i'm sure that infuriated the cia when he put that out there and they certainly and, and and the mainstream media in this country and i don't think even in europe really didn't pick up on vault seven i i thought it was a, a very important dump uh, well tell me about it because i don't know what you're talking about vault seven is is you know and i can't because i'm a luddite you know i saw the guy in the white suit with david <laughs> that's me i'm the guy in the white suit david niven um and so I, I, I like the Luddites, but but it's all about the, the CIA and their their massive surveillance, mass surveillance, uh, and all of the techniques that they use. And, and there were Stefani Morizzi was on uh, months ago and explained all these different uh, programs that they were uh, using uh, to spy on everybody. You know, so oh. I don't think they wanted that out, and the story died quickly. Uh, Vault 7. And he got Cablegate. He embarrassed a lot of people with Cablegate. I, I, that was extremely important. And uh, I want to get back just to uh, uh, the Black community should be supporting Julian Assange, because if you look at where he's put most of his work, it's in countries of color that have been invaded by the US, the UK, France, you know, whether those countries uh, that have been recipients of, of the carnage. It's I Iraq, it, it's Yemen, uh, it's, um, it's in uh, Venezuela, it's in Honduras, uh, Afghanistan. So I don't understand, and Somalia, I don't understand why there isn't a bigger outcry uh, by the politicians. And you've already said it, they want to be part of the, and Cornel West said it as well, uh, they want to be part of that elite. They want that they can talk about domestic stuff, about wages and health care, but not about that. Yeah, but what's encouraging, and I've, I've seen this, I've seen this at work when I've been in meetings with activists and I've seen people who are like, might be very happy to talk about Ferguson and Black Lives Matter, and da, 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 but if you stray on to Palestine, they go a bit blank and, and go, why are we talking about that? We're talking about that, brothers and sisters, because this problem is international. Go and watch Raoul Peck's documentary series, right? Exterminate the brute. You are not the only brute, and neither, neither are the Palestinians, right? Well, you've been such a, a, a fervent, eloquent um, advocate for uh, uh, Palest uh, Palestine. Uh, and so give us... Uh, your, your sense of what's happening and what's with the new prime minister, where they're going there. They're not going anywhere and they won't go anywhere until such time as we, the people, persuade our governments to tell them, oi, stop it. Or, you, or we're not going to trade with you. We're not going to... We're, we're, in fact, we're going to do everything. We're going to impose sanctions on you like we do on other countries. They impose sanctions on other countries for all the wrong reasons, it turns out. But if other countries were doing what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people, which is exterminate the brutes, that's their policy. It's open genocide going on. It's not quite Auschwitz. It's not putting them on trains and shooting them in. But 
They are starving them out of, a lo- of existence, out of a life. Look at Gaza, two million people living in a piece of land that's 20 miles by seven miles long, with the, with the borders completely closed and surrounded on all sides, starving them to, starving them to death, except they don't. And they've come out openly and said, we actually allow just enough calories to get in so that they don't quite starve to death but we make certain they're miserable. Life is misery in Gaza, you know. So so what's going to change it? Nothing until you and I and the rest of the people, this is down to the choir. This is why you and I preach to the choir, because we want that thing when voices join in harmony at last and... Something, you know, what did I write? I wrote a long poem about this years and years ago, but uh, witchcraft and, you know, Kant and what are pushed into the past, where voices join in harmony. And the sound of our choir is so loud. And the message of love for our brothers and sisters is so powerful that we override the needs and desires of the corporate bodies who rule the world, the few oligarchs all around the world who make the decisions as to what's going to happen. So we break, we're going to have to break this cycle of inhumanity to our brothers and sisters for all that. It can't just be for the black lives in, in the United States of America. It's got to be for all black lives everywhere. You know, there is something about... It's something you can't say in, in America. You can't say all lives matter because that's seen as being anti-black. And I understand right. the positions. You know, I, I, I watch very closely and listen as much as I can to all the debate going on around that. I'm a huge fan of Mark Lamont Hill. So I read oh, his book, too. We Still Hear, you know, that he that came out recently. I think it's great. And I learned a lot from it as well. You know, but we've got to, we have to accept that what has been imposed on the on African slaves in the United States has been imposed on people all over the world by the Euro um, centric racist crazed colonial philosophies that came out of Europe in the 15th, 16th, 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. And it's and it's all of a puzzle, and it's going on right now in the Holy Land. You know, a Cornell West would totally echo and has what you just said that this is going on, and all lives around the world, all oppressed people, all victims of, of uh, war crimes or victims of starvation. Uh, you know, they all. And he goes around the globe. He was on a, a couple of months back. Uh, talking about it, um, and we must be concerned uh, globally uh, about, uh, you know, the oppressed and and those yearning to be free, if I may uh, quote something from that uh, lousy statute that we got from uh, France at some point. Um, What are we missing right now? With Assange being, first, he was shut down for one year uh, by Linda Moreno, and then shut down for two and a half years almost uh, inside Belmarsh. What do you think he would have focused his attention on? What are we missing? What have we missed uh, that Assange could have uh, exposed? We'll never know. I mean, I could sit here and guess, but we, we won't know about this. Let's get, we need to get him out of prison. I mean, Kristen, what's his face? Halstrom, is that his name? Who's yeah. taken over. And I've read some of his history as well. And he's obviously really solid guy and I'm sure he's doing a great job but so much of his energy is being taken up with trying to free his boss yeah get him back behind a desk doing the job that they must be being distracted from the work that they're supposed to be doing hugely and quite rightly because yeah you should you down you down tools and go we've got to get we have to find some justice for this man now so I don't know what we've missed, but I bet you this, I bet it's a hell of a lot. I right. bet we've missed a hell of a lot. Yeah. And it and it 
sickens me and whatever. I'm just, I, I want something else that I just wanted to say was, and I can't remember why I wanted to say this, maybe just to lighten the atmosphere slightly, yes. because we have been banging on about all kinds of misery yeah. and pain. It's almost like we're at a wake here. Yeah. I, I may have told, I may have had this conversation with you before. I had a, I played golf once with, uh, at, at an international match between celebrities of the United Kingdom and the United States. And on the opposing team was a country singer called Glenn Campbell. Right. Yeah. And so there we were boshing around and I wasn't playing with him, but I was going down a fairway at some point and somebody said, hey, come meet Glenn, you know. So I went over and I said, hey, Glenn, blah, 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 and whatever. And I stood there for a minute and he was going full steam. He was a great, I, it's the only time I ever met him. So I don't really know what he was like. He was a great guitar player, singer, as we all know. Anyway, he suddenly started talking about learning to swim. And I thought, well, this is interesting. He said, I remember when my daddy taught me to swim. I'm not sure he talked like that, but it was yeah, something that's like good. that. That's a good, why don't you see Rhinestone Cowboy for us? Because <laughs> uh, I don't know it. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> yeah, no, the idea of rhinestones and cowboys sticks in my craw, frankly. But, but having said that, I don't want to make, I don't want to make, uh, why are you looking at Pancho Villa over your shoulder? <laughs> There's a rhinestone cowboy right there. <laughs> so he said, um, yeah, well, I, I learned to swim. And um, he said, my daddy, he rode me out in the middle of the Mississippi River and he just threw me over the side of the boat. And damn, I, I learned to swim pretty damn quick like that. And people were going, why is he telling us this? And then he said, yeah, learning to swim was the easy part. It was getting out of the sack that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny, very funny. And I thought, oh, Glenn, that is a proper joke. And yeah. he's probably told it a thousand times before, and but it's good, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's good. I think uh, we'll use that as a promo for this show, uh, the Glenn Campbell story. I love the third man, by the way. Oh, yes. Uh, when you sent me one of your shows, and I went, fuck me, it's the third man. How cool. Yeah. And oh, I, I went... Did. I went all Orson Welles and, you know, the movie. and Joseph Cotton. Yeah. Uh, and who played the, uh, was it Alec Guinness that played uh, the cop? Probably. Yeah. It, it's really a, a great film. And I like that music, you know. Uh, I forgot the name of the director. It, it slips my mind. It's a, yeah, me too. Uh, you know, he was an Austrian in 47, 48, and they had everything all set, but they didn't have the music. And he saw this guy... Um, Anton Karras playing in a, a Viennese a cafe and he says that's it and he got him and he composed music uh, for the third man and uh, I, I wish I could I, I wish I could remember his name I know it's a sir something but he's made uh, a, a lot of films and this is the first time in my life where my uh, dementia is beginning to uh, you know run my uh, mind um, so uh any uh, last thoughts? We're going to be, after uh, you, we're going to be going to uh, Columbus and we're going to be speaking for a few minutes to get an update from John Shipton uh, about the, the tour that they're on. Uh, that, by the way, was such a great, I'll never forget that time on the stage with you. It really was quite an honor, man. And, and well, so enjoyable. I it mean, will happen again, I'm sure. Huh? I'm sure it'll happen again. I hope so. Please take me on the Shipton Road Show, would you? Well, it was good. We were down the because Chris Hedges and Aaron Marte down the other end of the table are firebrands. Yeah. And I admire them both enormously, but they're much more professional than you and me. Right. And they, they stick more within, you know, some kind of boundaries of polite debate than right. either you do or I do. So it was nice to be down RM being kind of irreverent and uh, throwing the old F word in and going, let's, I mean, you know, sometimes people say to me, um, well, you know, you should just tone it down a bit. You know, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar or whatever. And, and I go, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. And then I go, no. 
No, I'm shouting from the rooftops. I have to do it in my own way, in my own style, in my own whatever. And if I make enemies, I don't give a fuck. I'm, in fact, if I don't, I'm not doing my job. I am well, not I, being persistent. I, I, I can't work any other way. You know, I had some notes, but I can't read. I couldn't even read properly the uh, the John uh, Pilger homage to you, homage to you. Uh, but uh, it's just not, uh, I grew up, I started in lounges in Vegas back in the mid seventies when I was 20 years old. And so I was around, I was doing five or six shows a night and you had to go up there and basically extemporize every show. So that's still in my blood. Whenever I did a television show, I had to work like 10 days to try to do the same thing from top to bottom. I, I can't do it. And some people are good at it. They can read, I can't do it. Those guys were great. Those are serious journalists. Aaron Maté and uh, and uh, Chris Hedges. And by the way, the name of that director was Sir Carol Reed. He's the oh. guy who directed that film. Yeah, uh, correct. Um, any last thoughts? I've had you on for a long time, more more than I, I think you wanted to do here, uh, that I, I said I did just 20 minutes and now, now it's been uh, over an hour. Any last thoughts about Julian? Uh, what uh, or, or something you can say uh, to his supporters out there, what they should be doing right now to kind of expedite this process in getting him out. All they can do is make as much noise as possible upon uh, on on his behalf. It was a bit like Chris said on the panel that you, you and I both attended last week. He said, "There's only there's only one way to there's only one way that revolution happens or that change happens, and that is getting people in the street." to demonstrate in large numbers and whatever. So if you can't be in the street, then be on be on social media, be, but make sure that your voice is being heard and make sure that you talk to everyone that you know and make sure that you are vociferous in the demonstration of your love for freedom of speech in general, and Julian Assange in particular. And I've never met Julian Assange, and I cannot wait for the moment when he gets out, because we can't, we, because he has to. Right. And, it, and it has to be tomorrow. It can't be the day after tomorrow. It has to be today. Got to get him out today. Biden, let him out. Blinken, just sign the papers. You can do it. You can circumvent all this bullshit because we know the legal process is complete bullshit. There isn't a single legal reason for Julian Assange to be incarcerated right now. Just admit it. Be men. Right. Be men. Just for once in your life, be men. Do, I, I do what my mother told me I should do. Think it through, get all the information. Then you've done the hard work. Then just do the right thing. The right thing is to set Assange free today. Well, I'm not going to follow a quote of your mother's. That, that really uh, ends this show. Um, good luck on your tour. I don't know when it starts, uh, but uh, this is not a drill tour. Uh, I see you're like 90 cities, uh, you know, uh, making up for 2020. And my dentist has... August 30th, 2022, he's already bought the tickets. So thank you very much, Roger. Uh, we're gonna take a quick music break and come back with uh, Julian's father, uh, John Shipton. We'll be right back. Uh, Roger Waters. What a lively discussion that was. And oh. now, now we are being joined by the man of the hour who's on a uh, cross country tour on behalf of his son, Julian Assange, and that is.
John Shipton. He and his uh, other son, uh, Gabriel Shipton, uh, Julian's brother, are in Columbus right now, I think like on their fifth city, Miami, Boston, New York, DC, and Columbus. So uh, you're the world traveler. How's it going there, John? Yeah, excellent. We just uh, this afternoon drove up from Columbus after we did a, an action outside the Columbus State House. It was quite good and, and surprising that there's a a cadre, a cadre or a group in uh, Columbus who are actively seeking Julian's freedom. And yeah. now we're in Indianapolis. You're in um, Indianapolis now? Yeah, Indianapolis. And uh, uh, walking walking down to the circle where the uh, memorial is for the, uh, the Civil War Memorial, 1861, 1864, you see people with open carry, uh, which uh, you, you don't see anywhere else in the world. So, no, everyone's got, it, everyone's got it in their, uh, in their lapel, small guns here in New York. Uh, <laughs> and where you were in Woodstock, everybody's got a gun here. This is like either you're for guns or against guns. And it's a, it's a, it's a weird community, not a weird community, but uh, uh, you know, divisive community. Uh, so it went well, uh, and uh, are, are you getting uh, not jet lag, but driving lag? No, no all, all good. Uh, so we're, we're really, uh, um, how could you describe it? It was just so extraordinary. Uh, Roger Waters' intercession by uh, uh, calling out uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and that, that got the reverberations over the entire world and a conversation which uh, sort of stimulated dinner parties and even Newsweek had an article uh, on uh, on Rogers uh, instructing uh, us as, the, as to the quality of Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, we talked, we talked about that and also the fact that, you know, Julian had warned me and others uh, years ago to stay off of Facebook, they're intrusive, and now he's like one of the most powerful uh, CEOs on the planet, and he's collaborating uh, with, with the powers that be, and uh, I think that was a very gutsy thing by Roger uh, to add on, and it, all, it was on CNN, I saw it on CNN, so uh, he, he broke the barrier with that one, he was uh, on fire, as they say. Yeah, yes, he was great. Actually, uh, and uh, Chris Hedges is getting good repeated runs all over the uh, all, all over the alternative media. So it's uh, all all in all an excellent meeting. You, of course, had us all in stitches and gathered the whole thing together. Uh, it was under a lot of fun. Single umbrella. That was great work of yours. Yeah, well, the whole thing was really good. Of course, there were a couple of people that tried to crash it at the end, but, uh, you know, that happens in all these events. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's, you know, I never say that what party I'm with. I just say I'm an activist and I'm here for science. I don't need to identify uh, a party. I don't think, uh, you know, people need to do that. But I'm glad that it went well in Columbus because my brother, uh, lived in Columbus until he died uh, 10 years ago. So I know that area really well, but I didn't know it would be that active. I'm, I'm really happily surprised. Yeah, yes, and Indianapolis as well has got a, an activist group that supports Assange. Just, uh, there's a couple of things. Professor Turley had a long article in the USA Today where he, he covered the matter of uh, Mary Garland discussing with the New York Times, the investigation of four of their journalists and the demands for uh, notes. Uh, also included in that article was the second half was a, a long deliberation on Julian Assange and the persecution of Julian and the ending of persecutions under the uh, Espionage Act of 1917. It's just amazing. Espionage Act 1917. It was only invented back then uh, to uh, quell dissent. That was the sole purpose of it. And, and that's what they're, they're doing right now. They don't want uh, open sunshine on the uh, kind of misdeeds that they are committing 
around the world, the powers that be. And uh, we discussed that uh, at length um, with uh, Roger and uh, he, that's it. He said, these guys just want to have, they want to be there. They want to make a lot of money. If it means killing people and torturing people, so be it. Um, so accurately describe, you know, characterize, let's say characterize and use their terms in, in such a characterization. It's terrorism of journalists and publishers. Right. Simple terrorism. Nobody will take upon themselves a 10 year persecution, a $10 million defense, lawyers in four jurisdictions, nobody. So everything now will be very, very quiet unless the United States, the Department of Justice in its wisdom withdraws this sort of terrorism and allows participation and creation in the policy and polity of the United States. I apologize on behalf of uh, all good, decent Americans here uh, who uh, enjoy uh, freedom of speech and, and, and the First Amendment, our cherished First Amendment, the most important one, of freedom of speech and assembly in the press. And uh, they've been stepping all over that, uh, that document, uh, that First Amendment, uh, for, for years in, in, in other cases, uh, whistleblowers, and now uh, for the last uh, two years with Julian Assange, although it was always pending, we knew, he knew it was always pending that they were going to use that, even though they were acting sub rosa. Um, what is your sense at this point uh, with the uh, momentum that is building? Uh, I mean, you're, you're here and you're energizing uh, the base. Uh, are you are you uh, more optimistic than you were last year? Oh, I'm very firm on optimism, uh, yeah, Randy. That's uh, you, you know, you can see structural changes. For example, the withdrawal of the subpoenas asking for the IP addresses uh, from the USA Today. Anybody who watched their video on the shootings in Florida. That's been withdrawn. Discussions with Merrick Garland on with the New York Times and the Washington Post on uh, the investigation of four New York Times journalists. The things are moving right along. And it seems as though it, to us on the outside, it seems as though Merrick Garland's administration of the Department of Justice is changing the Department of Justice to a more lawful outlook rather than a persecutorial outlook. It's like you said before, um, you know, uh, Barack Obama with Vice President uh, Joe Biden decided not to prosecute uh, your son under the Espionage Act because it crossed the line. Uh, but uh, here we are, uh, you know, four and a half years later, and, and Biden is, has, has been handed this from the Trump Justice Department. And, and is he going to carry on Trump's dirty work here, or is he going to uh, see the light? Uh, and I, I think I'm optimistic. I spoke about this on June 10th about the uh, inclusion of Vanita Gupta uh, as the third in line. Uh, she, you know, made her name uh, in, in a uh, in a movement down in a little city in Texas, and I work with her. And without the press, without the New York Times back then and, and the Daily News and WBAI and, and CNN and tons of other, without the press focusing on Tuya, uh, those people, the 46 that were shanghaied into the prison system under false uh, and racially uh, motivated charges uh, would still be in jail right now, except for a few have died. Uh, so I, I think that uh, it would be her legacy in a bad way if she doesn't, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't I can't imagine working for a Justice Department that would do this. Is what I'm saying, you know, well, the the, uh, the John Dima, who is the national security prosecutor that organized the prosecution from the for the Department of Justice against Julian, has just resigned and the new uh, nominee has a, a, a record in the uh, in the human rights area. So that's a good sign. 
I think I think so. And in the release of Reality Winner uh, uh, recently, uh, I, I think that there are if you read the tea leaves, but it's got to be done sooner rather than later because he's he continues to be under the, the, the thumb of, of, of this horrible prison uh, at Belmarsh. And it, I know it's having a psychological and physical toll on him. And this has got to be expedited. Not, no extradition, but expedition of his release. That's what we need right away. They can't wait any longer because it, it's, it, it is torture, not virtual torture, it's torture. Well, you, you know, in Europe, the Biden administration is making a worldwide push to reevaluate the United States' face to the world on values. And every time, every time they do something, somebody drops the Assange bomb on them, which is to say that they point out that they have a journalist now in jail in arbitrary detention for 10 years and in jail for the last two and a half years in Belmar's prison, a journalist and publisher. Well, it doesn't run anymore. You can't use the values to promote the United States and its allies as fair people with a free press. It's just not going to work. It's naked hypocrisy. It really is. It's transparent. That's the only transparency here is trans, trans, <laughs> transparent. Transparent. <laughs> uh, hypocrisy excuse me i was i i had a, a cashew in my uh, throat that's been hanging out there for about two weeks um so now on this mission here, you're on the mission here you're you're this goodwill tour if you will um and you're in indianapolis uh, where do you go from here uh, uh, up to chicago tomorrow We've got an event in Chicago in the afternoon and uh, events on uh, several radio stations in Chicago, which I don't know the names of because I don't do the itinerary. Um, I mean, yeah, but we'll, we'll get the itinerary to you this hour. Yeah, later. we'll put it up here. We're going to put it up. Uh, it's it's the uh, home run for Julian uh, tour. And um, I, I, I you're indefatigable. I know that because I met you back in January and I saw you a year earlier in uh, at Belmorish and it's like you're running around like the ever ready rabbit you know you have <laughs> you remember that ever ready ad yeah. still going <laughs> it's still going <laughs> yes what's the other one takes a licking and keeps on ticking uh, the watch. <laughs> next watch takes a yeah. licking keeps on ticking that's john shipton and and your <laughs> your son's able your son uh, uh gabriel uh, is uh, must be hard pressed to keep up with you no no those those two boys gabriel uh, and julian uh they outrun me they outrun me intellectually and and energy wise you know i can't i gotta pretend that i'm keeping up <laughs> oh wait a second you're a very modest man all right so uh, you're energetic, you're indefatigable, and uh, and you're modest. That's all. Those are all great traits. Um, let's uh, let's uh, wrap this up. I you're you're go going to the West Coast after that. You're going to um, yes. the Bay yeah. Area. You're going to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, you're going to Washington State, I believe. You're going to Colorado um, and um, a few other cities, uh, Los Angeles, and you uh, yes, Los Angeles. And you end up then back, back, then back to Washington D.C. for the so you the the rolling thunder rolls towards the center of power, and there we'll lay lay down the, the our uh, yeah July second I think we'll is. unroll our scroll and say to the Biden administration, look fellas, this boy is time for him to come home to his family and to really is it's time to go home to his kids and his partner and, and see his family, you and his brother Gabriel. Uh, there's a lot uh, that uh, he's missed out on 10 years, 10 years without sunlight. It's just amazing uh, how much time uh, and sacrifice uh, Julian. And, and people say, well, he, you know, he's taken it for all of us, but you know, he's human. And uh, this whole dehumanizing experience uh, definitely has a toll. It does. It does. 
yeah, it takes a toll. But the redemption will come through just letting him out and getting a bit of sun and uh, cuddle the kids and and have a, a glass of wine with you and I over there. Well, if you're off the wagon by then, of course. Yeah. I'm going to be off the wagon after this, trust me. Roger, Roger drank that really nice bottle of, uh, I forgot what it was, but it was white wine, and he seemed like he was really enjoying it. Uh, what what a great show this has been. Uh, can, can I uh, just get you uh, to say, what's the website? It's a, Assange Defense. Uh, 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 home Run, the figure four, Assange, uh, sorry, Home run the figure for Julian.com. That's it. So home home run, run for Julian. Julian. That's it. Yeah. People can get it. Yeah. And, and, and if you're watching this, please show up. It's really important, isn't it, John, that people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a matter. Of, I mean, it's a. Uh, here we are, a few Australians and Randy defending with all our strength the, uh, the First Amendment. I'd like you all to join in. Yes. Well, uh, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul here at Assange Countdown to Freedom.com. Uh, please go to our website. We have uh, 70 uh, of our uh, shows over the last year and uh, four months. Not all of them before, but all over the last uh, year and uh, four months, including two with uh, Mr. Shipton here, uh, with, uh, with John Pilger, with Stefania Morici, Cornell West, and now Roger Waters and Craig Murray. And uh, we salute Craig Murray. We're there for you, Craig. Uh, and uh, I know you're going to win this uh, battle there in Scotland. Uh, John, um, thanks a lot uh, for, uh, I know you. It's a pleasure. Uh, maybe uh, you and I, after Julian gets up, we'll go over and give give uh, Craig a hand if, he, if, if by then he hasn't floored them. I don't know if I can go back to the UK after I uh, some photos came out from the trial. Uh, I don't want to be held in contempt, and they'll put me in for eight months, and there'll be there'll have to be a countdown for Credico. Uh, no, no uh, flying to host it. <laughs> flying to to uh, Edinburgh. That's okay. a different state. I, uh, I'm going straight to Edinburgh. I'm not going. I've had enough. <laughs> I've had enough shepherd's pie and enough uh, bland tea. Uh, to want to go to London again. So I've seen all the sights and I, I've seen enough, but I certainly hope uh, I will see Julian in the coming months rather than the coming years. Uh, God bless you for your all the work that you have done and your strength and uh, and your wisdom and, uh, and your sense of humor. You and Julian and, and Gabriel and everybody I've had on this show has a great sense of humor in spite of the difficult moments that we are going through so we're going to go out here uh, this is and i think you might have been there for this this is um our guest earlier today roger waters in london at a don't extradite assange event uh, john pilger introduced him and then he came out and saying i wish you were here and uh, so we're going to play that out and uh, we'll see you soon. I think John Pilger will be our next guest next week. Uh, thank you all. And, thank you. Uh, Godspeed. Godspeed. Yes.
So you think you can tell Heaven from hell Blue skies from pain Can you tell it from From a cold steel red A smile from a veil Do you think you can tell And if they get you to trade Thank mm -hmm. you.